Right, well, good morning again. So uh, nice to see everybody. Uh, Graham and I have been away for a few weeks and it's actually good to be home, good to be in our own bed. Um, and, but it was lovely to catch up with the family out in California. I had a great holiday, one that was hand pre planned pre COVID. So we've waited a long time to be able to go and do that. So we're very fortunate. So my name's Jill Blow. I'm one of the, uh, the members here and I'm leading the services more. It's my pleasure to lead the service. And uh, welcome to those on Zoom. And I can actually see the Wills family, and I can actually see Dawn and Mike, and I can see Bryony. So good morning to you as well. Um, and you're welcome as well. Uh, so I just want to just to calm our hearts and our thoughts and our minds. Uh, I don't know about you, but we prayed before the service, and suddenly time ran away with me this morning, and um, I had to be here before I realised. So I got tied up with things. And one of the things I was tied up with was trying to get the printer to work to run off one of the notices. So, hey ho, note to husband, please leave the printer on. So, um, right, good. So I just want to read some scripture from Luke 24. And on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. He is not there. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. He has risen. We have a risen living saviour that we celebrated uh, last Sunday. And uh, I just wanted to remind us that our God is very much alive and with us. Just going to take some time now just to uh, share some notices and bless the offering. There you go. Thank you, Josie. That's good. As I said, I was, this morning I was held up a little bit because I was trying to run this off because I'm not very good at remembering things and I don't normally run it off. So I thought I'll do it this morning. Of course, the printer can get it to work because I'm not very technologically minded. Anyway, I've got it. And actually, there's a wealth of stuff happening. And that's what quite overwhelmed me actually when I was reading it. Um, so, a couple of things to draw your attention to just in the coming weeks. Um, Zoom prayer night tonight at uh, Sunday at 7.30, yep, and the code is on the handout, which is great, which I had to look for, so that's good, it's on the handout. Um, so if you've got one, or you haven't got one, if you can print it off, print it off, or somebody can have this copy if you want, because I can print another one now, I know how the printer works. Anyway, let the printer go now, I won't mention it again. Who let the dads out? Saturday the 14th of May at the hideaway. Great time for dads and uh, kids and members of the church to get together at the hideaway. So that's a good time to be remembered. And if you haven't been, go because I know it's a good time. So who let the dads out? Saturday 14th. I've also got obviously the news update to remind you about on Church Together Night, which is on Wednesday the 18th. And it's from for food from about six o'clock. Um, so I think we're just going to let people know whether you're coming or not. Is that right? Okay. And just to encourage you about some uh, other up and coming events, one is um, on Saturday the 21st, Carl Beach, who is, well, he's a friend of the church really, and uh, he's a national speaker who heads up um, Edge Network, I think it's called, isn't it? Yeah, Edge Network. And he's coming to uh, lead a men's session on the Saturday, and he's also coming to speak to us on the Sunday. And I know whenever he's spoken, they've been absolutely really positive, encouraging and affirming times. So let me encourage you to come along to hear Carl Beach um, 
speak on the Sunday. And if you're a man, go to the men's breakfast on the 21st. Evening, sorry, beg your pardon, yeah, not breakfast. Okay, Ukraine fundraising event is all there. It's about the Northwest Baptist Association are doing uh, songs for Ukraine. New Northwest Baptist Band Aid. That's interesting. Who's in the band? Uh, all right. Phil Jump, Jonathan. All oh, right, okay. So it is some. It's no all, it's all Are you playing the cajon? Oh, no, no, oh. proper drum. Proper <laughs> well, I thought it was quite good. Right, okay. Um, so that's the notices. Anything else? What anybody wants to sort of share notice-wise? Anything that anybody's got burning that they want to tell everybody about? No. Okay. Right. So, uh, just want to thank you for this offering, Lord Jesus, and we just thank you for the regular contributions financially that people make to this church. Lord, we just lift this money and all those standing orders or direct debits or however the money comes in, Lord. We just pray that it would be used for your glory and your kingdom come. Father, we thank you for the generous spirits uh, that give money, and Lord, we don't take it for granted. It's all from you. Many blessings that you give us, Lord. We just want to give back to you. Lord, we just thank you for this. Amen. Okay. Right, so I don't know about anybody else, but I'm going to pick that little microphone up. Um, but anybody like eating out and going out? <laughs> Does anybody else like going out? Yeah, good. Where do you like going out? Nice restaurant. Okay, good. So anybody, got anybody that would, they would particularly like to visit or house to visit in the world, if you could visit anywhere, whose house would you like to go to and have a meal or just meet up with them at their house? What do you think? Oh, come on. I thought you were going to rely on you. you be like... <laughs> Mr. Go on. The president's house in America. Okay, well, is that because you're going to America soon, but you're nowhere near the house, so you're not going to get an invite, I'm telling you now. However, why would you want to go to the president's house? To meet him. To meet him, to, to, to spend time with him, get to know him. Yeah, good one. Anybody else? Any of the adults? Come on, no, come on, Joseph's granddaughter at the back. Come on. Who would you like to go and see or be with? Kim Kardashian. Kim Kardashian now. Why would you want to go to her house? Um, because she has kids. So you get to know the children or the members of the family and just spend some time in a very wealth and opulent surrounding maybe. Yeah, good. Okay, anybody else? Come on. Simon Cowell's house. Simon Cowell. Now I know I've got an inkling, is, I don't know you very well, but I've got an inkling you might be a reason why. Why would you want to meet Simon Cowell and go to his house? Because I think he's fit. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I'd just, uh, just sing in front of him just to see what he thought. Brilliant. And that's what I was thinking as well. That would be a fantastic opportunity, wouldn't it? So he would see what, uh, what uh, strengths you've got in, in terms of vocal. Anybody else? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Mary Berry's house, because obviously she makes the best cakes. Mary Berry. But don't you bake? Bit. So you'd like to learn from Mary Berry, the expert in baking cakes. Debbie Burr's a good one as well, so you know, you say that as well. Uh, I saw uh, Mary Berry on a programme. She was teaching some men to cook. She, they were doing a meal for a fundraiser. It was actually a really good evening. Come on then, young man. Who would you want to go to? Whose house do you want to go to? The Queen. Do you know what? I'm with you on that one. Yeah, apart from Gary Barlow, but there's another reason for that one. But you want to go to the Queen's house? Oh, right, so the ones in London. So the Buckingham Palace and Boris Johnson's house at number 10. Why would you want to go? Um, because I went to London and I really liked it. Well, they've got, that's a good reason to go and see, just to see what people have got. I think that's important. But one of the main things that I like uh, is actually just meeting up with people, just being with people. And I'm sure you know that I'm a people's person. So, um, one of the meals we had recently at our house, and I think Andy's got a slide, which I really did enjoy, was our house group lunch. Have you got this? You did. <laughs> we're 18 of us, we sat around the table, I didn't think we were going to sit down, but we all managed to sit down, and Graham made a big sh uh, 
Me potato pie. Irrelevant details, but I don't know whether you can recognise some of the faces there. We all sat down, and what I really enjoyed, um, and this does tie in with what hopefully Jonathan's going to be talking about later, about hospitality, mission, and uh, spending time with each other, getting to know each other, was the fun that we had around that table. Not just eating the food, but actually spending time together, chatting. We had a few tears because some people didn't like to lose in the game. Yeah, but that was okay because we encouraged them to rejoin and join in again. What is it? That was Irene. <laughs> yeah, that was it. <laughs> okay, and um, you know, we encouraged each other, we laughed, we cried, um, we got to know each other, and we were just having fun together. But I got to know people on a different level because I'd not met them and, and managed to meet Melissa and chat with Melissa. I'd never chatted with Melissa, so it was a good way of getting to know people. It doesn't have to be a meal, obviously. It could be just a cup of tea or just a pop-in visit. Um, it's just that I like cooking and so does Graham. So we managed to do a meal. It was great. So really, you know, Jesus went to quite a few meals and he also blessed people. He went to the wedding in Canaan where he blessed that ceremony because they ran out of... Uh, juice to drink at the wedding yeah turn the water into wine he went to Zacchaeus's house he went to somebody's house that actually not a lot of people wanted to go to yeah but he went and spent some time with him and had tea with him so just let me encourage you a little bit about hospitality we share our lives with people in order to get to know them but we share our lives in order to share Christ with them as well so I just wanted to encourage you in that area as, uh, as we go into our preach later can I just pray before the children go okay Lord Jesus you call us to do um, with others uh, what the world may not do and that's just be ourselves and Lord we just pray that you would just enable the children to be themselves as they go out now um, and spend time learning more about you pray for Anne and Caroline as they lead the children's work Lord and we pray for the young people as they go out and hear more about you and what it means to do, to be a, a, a disciple of yours Lord Jesus bless them and just enable them to be relaxed in, uh, in in what they're doing this morning Lord we just thank you for them and encourage us all in that area of mission and hospitality and welcoming and opening ourselves up to share more about you in the everyday amen I think the children are going to go. Okay, Jonathan's going to come and preach to us now, but I just want to pray with you, Jonathan, before we do, if that's okay. I'm sure it would be. <laughs> Lord Jesus, we just thank you for this man, this man of God, and we just thank you for all that he does in your name. And Lord Jesus, now we just pray that your spirit would bless him and empower him with the words to share this morning. Lord Jesus, just be with him now and bring your word. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Let's just uh, put that one off. Um, just going to put my phone here just in case there's any tech issues, but hopefully all will be well. So hi everyone, hope you're okay? Okay. Uh, this morning we're starting our new preach series, which is always an exciting moment, isn't it? And uh, thank you, Jill. And the series is ironically called... Did somebody say, just preach? It's a slight play on words on a well-known food delivery company. Uh, but we're exploring the big idea that forming disciples, that growing as disciples, doesn't only happen through preaching on a Sunday service, although we do believe that preaching is part of that. But that this command to make disciples is uh, worked out through building Christ-centered community, through hospitality, through eating and sharing food together. And this might not be a particularly new idea, but if I was coming with particularly new ideas, they'd probably be heresy, wouldn't they? So anyway, I think it's a really important idea for us to get hold of if we're to become the people that God calls us to be. We've had two years where at times it has been illegal to socialize do you remember those days where like you, you couldn't see anyone you had to choose maybe one person to be in a bubble with uh, or one other household to see there's been times where there have been limits and restrictions on what we've been allowed to do socially 
It's been a really challenging couple of years to build community and uh, actually there are some people for whom even right now caution around socialising is still necessary and understandable. But as we emerge, as the weather gets warmer, as we're able to be outside a bit more, I really hope that uh, as we get into the summer months I'd encourage us as much as I can not only to gather on a Sunday morning, but to, to really engage with building community, with being church beyond Sundays, eating together, uh, sharing hospitality with people, inviting people over, letting our lives be an example to others, and actually forming disciples as we do. Now you might think, why should we do this? Uh, the church shouldn't just be a social club, should it? Like we're not here just to be a social club, to eat nice food and to have a nice time. And that's true. But we should be becoming a loving community seeking to follow God's word and drawing others into that loving community as we do so. So here are three good reasons as we start this series to embrace eating together, building community and being the church beyond Sundays. And the first reason is this, that the early church modelled it. The early church modelled it. We read it in Acts 2 verse 42 onwards about the community of the first believers. It says this, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayers. And awe came upon every person and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and their belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favour with all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now that, that passage could be a preach in its own right, really, about the, the early Christian community. But we're not going to go there today. I, I do want to zoom in on the community aspect a little bit, the food aspect a little bit. We've read twice there that they were devoted to breaking bread. Day by day, meeting in their homes, breaking bread again, receiving their food with glad and sincere hearts. There's more going on than just food and getting together but let's recognize that those things are going on they are an important part of the early church community it was more than sundays it was participating in the lord's table it was eating together it was open homes it was sharing generosity building community the early church the first church models to us that being god's people is about more than sundays yeah Secondly, the apostles and the New Testament writers encouraged it, taught it and lived it. We're not just talking about isolated incidents here and there. The spectrum of the New Testament writers, they all put value on and write to the churches about hospitality, about welcome, about open homes, about eating together. So Paul in Romans 12:12 12, 12, said this be joyful in hope patient in affliction faithful in prayer and the very next verse says share with the Lord's people who are in need and practice hospitality I feel like I'm going to sneeze but we'll just carry on practice hospitality now you might think I'm not very good at hospitality well practice hospitality and then you'll get better. Peter, in 1 Peter 4, verses 8 to 10, he said this, Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Osp offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So here we have it again, serve others, love one another, offer hospitality different writer different group of christians same theme three john verses seven to nine one of those books that you probably don't go to quite as often as others but it's there in three john 
uh, we read this, it was for the sake of the name that these believers went out, receiving no help from the pagans. We ought therefore to show hospitality to such people so that we may work together for the truth. Now that's a slightly different context, but in that passage, John is writing about hospitality to other believers, and we may not know them personally, but if they're doing the Lord's work, being a blessing to them. If they're preaching Christ, we're on the same team. So bless them, feed them, support them. We ought to show hospitality to such people, working together for the truth. And similarly, the writer to the Hebrews, whoever that actually is, continues on these themes of welcome and blessing. Hebrews 13, do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by doing so, some have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Now we might be inclined to read these today and go, well, that was then, this is now, you know, that was Middle East 2,000 years ago, the times are different, the culture is different. Uh, we might be inclined to say, let's get to know people before we open our homes up to them. Let's get to know people a bit before we start being generous, before we start feeding them. Let's just be careful. We don't want to go all in. But I think the New Testament actually says go all in. It says go all in. When it comes to hospitality, when it comes to blessing, it is a case of bless people, feed people, love people. Even if you don't know them that well particularly, bless them and love them it's part of being the people of god it's not part of our british culture i think so much at the moment but i remember uh, we went on holiday to turkey years ago before we had kids and um, just the hospitality of the people there was incredible i mean it might have been to try and get us to buy stuff but shopkeepers shop owners are uh, saying to, to me by all means, your wife can look around the shop. You come and eat with me. It's one of the best kebabs I've ever had. As me and this Turkish shopkeeper are just eating. And Caroline is, you know, doing what she does, looking for a bargain. And it's not part of our, maybe part of our natural mindset. But actually, I think we are called to embrace hospitality. It's a shift from, this is my space and I need my time. So this is God's space and we've been entrusted with it to be a blessing and to build the kingdom of God. And actually we're seeing that as, as God's people open their homes to displaced Ukrainians uh, tonight. Like, it's like this is God's space and we're called to use it to build the kingdom. It is living the gospel. Like, what a thing to do. Last verse uh, from these New Testament writers. One of my favourite verses in the New Testament, Paul this time to the church in Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 8 onwards, says this, Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our very lives as well. Like We shared the gospel, we preached the gospel, but we shared our lives as well. Imagine if Paul preached the gospel but he kept people at arm's length while he did so. And the Thessalonians are going, well, we've, we've heard about Jesus and how he changes your life, but we can't really see that because we don't really know him. You know, Paul preaches a good preach, but we don't know how he's been changed because he nev he's never with us. We don't spend time. You know, Paul and his buddies, they shared their very lives with the church because forming disciples, becoming communities, of disciples it's caught as well as taught i mean it would be wonderful if it was all just taught wouldn't it like i'll just you know whoever's preaching can preach and everyone can just go that was a great preach we'll put it all into action but actually it's caught as well with lives shared we we catch it from other people we see how jesus has changed their lives we hear it in the stories they share in the testimonies they bring and, and we catch something of it as we follow their example. That's why Paul was able to say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. 
because he shared his life, a life that had been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, could, you know, could we say that? It's a scary thought, isn't it? Imitate me as I imitate Christ. You know, I really hope there aren't any of us who would be saying, I, I believe in Christ, but whatever you do, don't follow my example because it's rubbish. You know, Paul's able to say, I'm, I'm pursuing a life after Jesus, so, so, so follow my lead. We know we're saved by grace, we're living under Christ, pursuing a life of holiness, purity, obedience, aren't we? And when people see it, when they see a faith lived out, they, they catch something of it. So why should we build community? Why should we eat together? Why should we invite people over? Firstly, the early church did it. Secondly, the New Testament writers and the apostles encourage it, teach it, and live it. And then thirdly, perhaps the greatest reason is that Jesus, the one that we follow, our Lord and Savior, modeled it to us. And this sets us up for where we're going in the next sort of 10 Sundays or so, although there will be the odd random Sunday in there as well. We are mostly going to be in Luke's gospel and we're going to be exploring Jesus' meals with a mission. How Jesus' eating habits led to lives being transformed, disciples being made, those who were far away being drawn in and eternities being transformed. That's what it's about, isn't it? Yes. I think that what we see in Luke's gospel is that as lives and homes are opened up, hearts are opened up, and then lives are changed, eternities are changed. According to one writer, as much as 20% of Luke's gospel is based around meals. Of Jesus eating with these people, or sharing stories about this and that. And, you know, we see it's not just about being a social club. It is about making disciples, calling people to follow Jesus, sharing Jesus with others as we share our lives and as food is shared with others. We know it, don't we? But what we see in Luke's gospel is that community is, is built not in rows but around tables. Sharing food, sharing life, looking each other in the eye instead of looking at the back of people's heads. You know, the ability to say, tell us your story. How are you doing? What's going on in life? How's God at work in your life? We're going to see a variety of meals that Jesus engages in, attends, is invited to. And a number of meals that he teaches about. Meals in parables about the kingdom and, and how the kingdom is like this meal or the kingdom is like that. We're going to explore them all. And my hope and my prayer is that we would want to become those people. We would want to become those people of open homes, open hearts, open hands, welcome, hospitality, generosity, being formed into the likeness of Jesus as we follow him and seeing others formed into his likeness as we share Jesus with them, as we share not only the gospel but our very lives that have been changed by Jesus. Meals on a mission, uh, meals with a mission to the glory of God that's where we're going and we can all get involved we can all get involved you know, it doesn't have to be michelin star food but if you do get invited to the birds say yes it'll bless you but you know it, it could be a pot noodle it could be a pot noodle it could be a kebab it could be nuggets and chips yeah we can i'm not trying to put any pressure on you debbie right you could you can do pot noodles as well if you want you know, but we can all play our part. We can all play our part in becoming that community. We all can, can't we? So that's just the introduction. But I'm not going to talk for too long, so don't worry. We're going to look really briefly today at Luke 24. Uh, we, we left off last week with the resurrection appearances of Jesus. And we're in another resurrection appearance of Jesus, one that ends with a meal. So we're in Luke uh, 24, starting at verse 13. It's the road to Emmaus. Now that same day, two of the disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things 
with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and before the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem israel and what is more it is the third day since this all took place and in addition some of the women our women amazed us they went to the tomb early in the morning but they did not find his body they came and told us that they'd seen a vision of angels who'd said he was alive and then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. And Jesus said to them, how foolish you are, how slow to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it's nearly evening, the day is almost over. And so he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were our hearts not burning within us while he talked with us on the road and he opened the scriptures to us? And they got up and they returned at once to Jerusalem. And there they found the 11 and those with, him, uh, with them assembled together saying, it's true, the Lord has risen and he's appeared to Simon. And then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. So I promise I will keep it brief because we have already looked at the example of the early church. We've already looked at the teaching of the New Testament writers and I've got just two things coming out of this passage as we start this, these, these themes this morning. And the first thing is this, that it is through offering hospitality that these two disciples realize they are having an encounter with Jesus. It is through them, in using them using the gift of hospitality, that these disciples encounter Jesus. Because until that moment, they don't know it's him. They don't know he's with them. Clear pass and the other person, they're walking along the road. Jesus comes alongside them, but they don't know that it's Jesus. And Jesus starts explaining the Old Testament to them. I, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall of that conversation, even though there wasn't a wall. But they, they don't know that it's Jesus. But, you know, the, the night's drawing in, it's getting a bit darker. Uh, they are coming towards their destination. Hospitality is part of their life. It's part of who they are, part of their culture. So Jesus is carrying on to wherever he was going. And the gift of hospitality rises up within these two disciples. You know, Jesus is going, look, it's been great chatting to you. All the best. God bless. And they just say, look, why, why don't you stay with us? Why don't you eat with us? Why don't you stay here? If they let him walk on, the moment is gone, isn't it? If the disciples let Jesus walk on, they don't know it was him. You know, they, they spend the evening. If they let him walk on, Cleopas and his friend spend the evening going that was a really insightful chat about the old testament wasn't it 
But it is through their hospitality that they see Jesus. Now, obviously for them, Jesus was physically present with them. They just hadn't seen it yet. I'm not trying to stretch the point completely here, but I truly believe that as we step out in hospitality, welcoming the stranger, opening our homes, sharing our food with others, we too will encounter something of the presence of Jesus. Because where two or three or more are gathered in his name, he is there also. He is with us as we open our homes, as we sit at the table. Hospitality is a mission gift and it is an opportunity to experience the Lord's presence as we welcome, bless, serve and eat with others. I truly believe that. These moments are acts of worship to the Lord in, a, in, a, in Matthew's gospel. We're not going to go there completely today, but Jesus talks about when you did these things for the least of these, you did it for me. These are acts of worship. These are moments where as we gather with others, Jesus is present with us by his spirit. There are people who are part of the church now and their journey to faith started with a meal. Whether that was an alpha meal or a meal around a table in a home or a curry night or whatever it might be. As we open our homes and our lives, as we bless and serve others, we meet with Jesus. He's present with us. We worship Jesus through these things. Have you ever had those moments where you've had people over and you've chatted or, you know, whatever, whatever and, and afterwards you go, wasn't God with us? Like, wasn't God with us? Wasn't that a great? Couldn't you feel that the Lord was with us as we chatted about this or as we spoke about that or as I got to share about this or as we got to pray about that? We had those moments. Cleopas opened his home and he saw the Lord. And when we offer hospitality, as we open our homes, as we open our table, we too can encounter the Lord. It's not just them, we meet with the Lord. You know, we might think, oh, if, if I open my home, if we we feed these people, we're going to bless them. They, they might meet with God, but we meet with God too. We meet with God as we offer hospitality in his name. So as we open our homes and our lives, as we bless and serve others, we meet with Jesus. But the second thing coming out of this passage uh, in Luke is that it is in the breaking of bread that Jesus is revealed. What's interesting is that in that culture, it would have been the host who might normally open the meal, might bless the food, the person whose home you were in who would welcome everybody. And Jesus has been invited in as their guest, yet invited in as their guest, Jesus becomes the central person in the meal. He becomes the host of the meal that he was invited to and it is in this role and in the breaking of bread that he is revealed for who he is he took bread he gave thanks he broke it and he gave it to them it follows the exact pattern of the last supper where we have read where we read many times while they were eating jesus took bread and when he'd given thanks he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And suddenly, in that moment, they see Jesus for who he is. This is the Lord. This is his meal. For those of us who may be sitting on the fence, or I know those catching up another day who may be sitting on the fence, there's this model, Jesus. Uh, so invite Jesus in. Invite him in, but let him become the central figure. Invite him in and let him be the one at the center. Let him be revealed for who he is. The Lord, whose body was broken and whose blood was shed for you. Invite him into your life and then let him invite you to the table. To receive grace and mercy and new life and eternity with him. When we invite him in, he invites us to his table. 
But the other thing would be this, that how we are at the table can reveal something of Jesus. How we are as we eat together. It's just wonderful hearing about that small group social. All 18 at the table. Laughing, joking, crying. Fighting. Not fight, fighting. Um, but how we are at the table can reveal something of Jesus to others. We, we can break bread together. It doesn't have to be in rows on Sundays. Remember the context of the Last Supper was a meal. It was part of a meal. In our eating together, we can remember the Lord together. We're going to do that shortly. But it's not just about the bread and the wine. In our habits, in our preferring of others, in our prayers, in our conversation. How we are as we eat can all reveal something of God's love and can, reveal, uh, can draw others to God's love. Like giving thanks for our food. Like giving thanks for our food is a really simple thing. It can be a natural part of our eating. Whoever is at the table, you know, are we those kind of, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to cause offence or anything, but, we're, you know, might we be those Christians who go, we're going to be thankful for our food to God when it's just us, but in front of people who don't know the Lord, we don't really want to, we don't want them to know. We can be thankful to God, unashamed of our thankfulness to God for all he's blessed us with. In our conversation, I think there is something really powerful about eating around the table, talking, sharing life, chatting, not just vegging out in front of the TV. I mean, full disclosure, we do have TV dinners sometimes. We have TV dinners. But if we've had a couple of TV dinners in a row, we will say, no TV dinner today. We're going to sit at the table, we're going to put the phones away, and we're going to talk and we're going to look at each other in the eye. Let's engage with the people in the room in front of us. Let's chat. How we talk, what we talk about can point others to the Lord as we eat together. There are, famous, uh, there are stories of the famous preacher Smith Wigglesworth who would stop the conversation at the table if it veered away from the Lord. You know, if it started going towards sport or the news or whatever it might be, it's like, no, we're going to talk about the Lord. I remember talking to Dan and Anna Churchman about Sunday lunch in the Romanian context and, and Anna saying how they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't dream of putting the TV on. They would sit and eat and talk for a few hours and they would talk about church that day. They would talk about church that day, what they'd learned, what was interesting, uh, discuss the, the preach ask questions of it and you know what were the kids looking at and all that and it's kind of like it was just about being together and and learning about the lord and and following on from the service is there a consistency in how we are as we eat together do we have christian meals with our church friends with quiche and couscous and other things and then do we have unchristian meals with our non-believing friends? Do you know what I mean? Like, let's have a Christian meal. We'll get the church people around and we'll be on our best behaviour. And then let's get the others around and we can just really let ourselves go. Because the, the, the church aren't watching. It doesn't matter because Jesus is watching. He's with you anyway. But how we are as we eat with unbelievers can draw them to the love of Jesus. How we are around the table can draw others to the love of Jesus because we don't just share the gospel with them but our very lives as well. Sitting down, talking about the Lord, discussing the scriptures. I'm not saying that it's always appropriate to do that. It might not be appropriate to, to do that every meal. But do you know what I mean? Do you know what I'm trying to say? It reminds me of these two disciples on the road walking talking sharing and the lord coming among them to explain the scriptures to them talking that leads to eating eating that leads to a revelation of who jesus is and that he's with them all of this in the home of people who said why don't you come in why don't you come in the home is opened up the meal is shared and jesus is revealed for who he is 
So I pray for us that we would be people who follow in the footsteps of the Acts 2 church. That we'd be people of hospitality and opening our homes and sharing food together and breaking bread together. I pray that we would embrace the teaching of the apostles around hospitality. I pray that we would follow in the footsteps of Jesus in our eating together, in being a people of hospitality with a purpose, meals with a mission that would draw others into the kingdom and would see us and others grow as disciples as we share our lives together. You know, when was the last time we, we had people over to eat? If it was recently, praise God, thank you, you know, feel proud and then repent of your pride. But you know, who, who could we eat with in the coming weeks to share what Jesus has done in our lives, to build others up as disciples, to share the faith that we have? Just think, as you offer hospitality, you will encounter the presence of God, his spirit with you. As you offer hospitality as an act of worship and you can introduce others to Jesus. As you give thanks for your food, as you talk, as you put others first, as you share your life, as you share how God's changed your life, I pray that we would become that community that is more than Sundays. Because we can't form disciples on Sundays, only on Sundays or only through Sundays. It's about whole lives of it. We're going to leave it there for today. As we begin to think about inviting others to our table, we're going to share communion as we're invited to the Lord's table. Just like those two disciples on the Emmaus Road, we are invited to know Jesus in the breaking of bread. N.T. Wright says this, Luke intends for the readers to see that this simple meal is taking us back to the upper room, to the Last Supper, but it's also pointing us forwards to the breaking of bread which would become the central symbolic action of Jesus' people. We're going to join with God's people all over the world this morning as we share communion, as we remember what Jesus has done for us. And as we, as we do that, we are, we're working through the remnant of the, the miracle meal. So if you didn't... Um, get one of these on the way in maybe Sam or Josie could uh, distribute some if you need one just put your hand in the air and we're going to bring ourselves before the Lord. So we're going to come to the Lord's table and if you love the Lord, this is for you. If you're not in that place of saying I'm a follower, I'm a disciple, there's no uh, embarrassment, just... Uh, allow us to celebrate who Jesus is and what he's done for us these words may apply to us come to this table not because you have to but because you are invited to not because you're strong but because you are weak come not because any goodness of your own gives you a right to come but because you know that you need mercy and help come because you love the Lord a little and would like to love him more. Come, if you are fearful, to be made new in the love of God. Come, if you are doubtful, to be made strong in your faith. Come, if you are regretful, to be made whole. Come, because Jesus loved you and gave himself for you. Come and meet with the risen Christ, for we are his body. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So let's eat together the body of Christ broken for you. And if you can get into it, let's, uh, let's drink together. The blood of Christ shed for you, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Let's pray together. And then Jill's going to lead us in a couple of prayers as well. Loving God, thank you for who you are and what you've done. That at the cross you made the way back to the Father possible. And that you invited us to your table, not because we were good enough, but because you are good enough. Because you want to pour out your grace on us and welcome us into your kingdom forever. Call us to be your people now, playing our part in your mission and the building of your kingdom. Lord, as we have been invited to your table, I pray for us that we would be a people who invite others to our table and share your love with them as we do. Thank you that as we offer hospitality, we will meet with you. And you will be there among us as we eat together. Lord, put a fire in our hearts to reach those around us who don't know you. That we would want them to experience your goodness. The goodness that you've poured out into our lives. We thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you for your present in our lives in the everyday. But Lord, I just want to thank you for testimony. It's powerful. It speaks of your goodness, your lov loveliness, your faithfulness and, your, and the endurance that we have when we know you. Lord Jesus, just enable us as we go out into the week to bring others to know you. Spend time with others, whether it's meal, cup of tea, whatever. Lord, just get alongside people so that they know that we have a mighty God who is worth knowing. Lord, we just praise your mighty name this morning. Thank you for being here. We praise you, Jesus. Amen. I just wanted to say thank you to the band. Thank you for leading us this, wor this morning in worship and song. And just your presence it just really lifts us into God's spirit as well. And thank you for that. And the guys at the back as well. The are guys, aren't you? <coughs> so thank you for all the technical stuff that you do. Behind the scenes, unsung, but thank you. It's not an easy task. I would never want to do it. And thank you, Jonathan, for bringing the word. It's a team effort. Amen. Good. Enjoy your cup of tea.